The middleweight division, home to some of the greatest fighters to have ever lived. But who was the best at this weight class? Let's find out in this experiment video in which I assign points based on fighters' achievements at middleweight. So time to head into how fighters earn points. So two quick notes before we get into the rules. Firstly, this is the fourth episode in my ongoing series. So if you haven't checked out the previous episodes, which were the heavyweight, light heavyweight, and the super middleweight cross cruiserweight video, I would highly recommend watching them first. I'll leave the links in the description below. If you have, or you just want to see this one first, then great. The second quick note is that the middleweight division is very complicated to assign points to to the highly volatile and ever-changing rules at the world title level before the reign of Jake LaMotta. So if I get something wrong, I apologize in advance. Now that that's over, let's quickly remind you of the rules. So the rules are that every world middleweight champion is included in the point gathering other than international or regular champions. Points will only be given for accomplishments at middleweight. Becoming the undisputed middleweight champion is worth 10 points. Fighters who won both the New York State Athletic Commission or the NYCAC titles and the National Boxing Association titles, the NBA title, or were universally recognized as the world champion prior to the introduction of alphabet titles will also receive 10 points. Winning the lineal middleweight championship is worth five points. Winning and defending either the WBC, WBA, IBF, and Ring Magazine title will earn them two points each. However, winning and defending the WBO title is worth only one point. Winning multiple titles in one fight will stack, but defending multiple titles will not. So for example, if a fighter wins the WBC and WBA titles in one fight, he will earn four points, but successfully defending both belts in his next fight will only earn him two points. Winning the Ring Fight of the Year is one point, and winning the Olympic gold medal at middleweight will also be worth one point and fighters who receive less than six total points will not be included nor will their points add to their points accumulation tally which we'll get into right now so the points accumulation tally is adding a fighter's total points from each division they earned at six points or more in if they have earned a high enough total amount of points they may be included in the top 25 list we include at the end of every video so it might sound a bit complicated, but if you've seen the previous videos or you see this video out until the end, you'll understand it more or less. Okay, now that all the convoluted stuff is out of the way, let's see some fighters who just missed out on the minimum six points or are just notable exclusions. So some interesting fighters who just missed out are Thomas Hearns, Roberto Duran, Nigel Ben, Chris Eubank, Steve Collins, Billy Joe Saunders, Roy Jones Jr., Daniel Jacobs, Laszlo Papp, and Al McCoy. For most of these fights, they just didn't stay as middleweight champion long enough. And in Billy Joe Saunders' case, he only held the WBO title, only earning one point for every defense. Legendary Laszlo Papp doesn't make it in due to never being given a title shot due to the Hungarian government denying him the opportunity. And Al McCoy. Now, he's the only fighter so far that I don't know how to personally score. Yes, he did become middleweight world champion, being George Chip by knockout. But this man's title defenses mostly consisted of losses. You may be asking, how does he retain the title if he loses? Well, at that point in history, in the mid-1910s, if a fight went to a newspaper decision, the title could not change hands. It would only change hands if the champion was knocked out. So he basically retained the title by technicality. I have no clue how to properly assign him points, so I'll leave it to the comments. How many points do you think the losing champion deserves? Okay, now let's actually get into the proper list. Six points for the people who just made the list are Al Hostak and Ken Overlin. Al Hostak would lose the National Boxing Association world title to boxing legend Tony Zale, who will be coming up later in the video. And Ken Overlin held the other portion of the title, the NYCAC title, at around the same period of time. Interestingly, after losing his title to Billy Seuss in 1941, Overlin would face Ezard Charles in his next bout, beating the legendary Charles on decision. Seven points we have Terry Downs and Lonnie Bradley. Terry Downs actually had a win over Sugar Ray Robinson, but that was at the end of Sugar Ray Robinson's career. Eight points we have Ben Jebby, Mike McCallum, Reggie Johnson, Sebastian Sylvester, and Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Only genuine thing I can say is I absolutely love Mike McCallum, but definitely am not a fan of Chavez Jr. Let's move on. Nine points we have a boxing icon and a boxing tragedy, Sugar Ray Leonard and Gerald McClellan. Again, Leonard didn't stay at middleweight really at all. He beat Haglin, won the lineal ring and WBC titles, and that was really his career at middleweight. McClellan won the biggest talents in boxing history, but the highlight reeler can compete with any of his peers. Won the vacant WBO title against John Mugabe, then beat Julian Jackson for the WBC title and defended it three times before moving up to super middleweight. This is where his tragic bout against Nigel Benn occurred where he suffered brain damage. He is now blind and almost deaf and cannot live without assistance. On a lighter note, 10 points we have current WBC King Jamal Charlo, Teddy Yarosh, Sumbu Kalambe, and Jorge Castro. Castro had fights with Roy Jones Jr., Terry Norris, and two fights with elderly Roberto Duran in 19 1997. He would lose three of these four fights, only being Duran in their first bout, only to lose the rematch. 11 points, it's the Puerto Rican icon Miguel Cotto. He won the WBC lineal and ring title against Sergio Martinez and defended
dominated it once against Aussie Danny Gill. He would lose the title in his second defense against Canelo Alvarez. Speaking of Danny Gill, he alongside Julian Jackson, Eddie Risco, and Keith Holmes have earned themselves 12 points. The biggest standout name here is 100% Julian Jackson, one of the hardest pound for pound punches ever. If he landed clean, he would more often than not send them to sleep. You can tell by his ridiculous 80.33% knockout percentage, according to BoxRec. Two fighters sit on 14 points. We have Vince Dundee and Felix Sturm. Vince Dundee, according to BoxRec, would fight legendary middleweight Freddie Steele, being utterly annihilated. He would be dropped 11 times, suffering a concussion and a broken jaw, but he was a good champion in his own right, having a win over another guy on the list, Ben Jebby. 15 points, we have Kim McCoy and Billy Papke. Papke would have a four-fight rivalry with legendary Stanley Ketchell, winning one and losing three. However, even though he only won one of four, the rivalry would forever live on in boxing legend. 16 points, we have Kelly Pavlik. Pavlik was the man who beat the last ever undisputed middleweight champion, Jermaine Taylor, twice, but he would eventually lose his titles to Sergio Martinez. 17 points, there is a lot to unpack. We have the first ever middleweight champion, the legendary Jack Nonpareil Dempsey. This is not the heavyweight Jack Dempsey. This Jack Dempsey was champion during 1890, nicknamed the Nonpareil because he was seemingly unbeatable. He would go his first 59 fights unbeaten before losing the lineal title in his second defense to another 17-pointer, Bob Fitzsimmons. Frank Klaus, Tiger Flowers, Randy Turpin, Michael Nunn, Rocky Graziano, and Marcel Sedan are the other names on 17 points. Sedan and Graziano didn't make a title offense, even though they were both heavily considered some of the greatest middleweights ever, especially Sedan. Another fact regarding them is that they technically didn't hold both the NYCAC and NBA titles. When Graziano beat Tony Zale for the title, the NYCAC actually revoked Graziano's license due to him not reporting two bribe offers. The NBA, however, refused to acknowledge this decision. Then when Zale regained the title from Graziano and eventually lost out to Sedan, Sedan would only win the NBA title as well. But both were universally recognized as the real middleweight champions as well as ring magazine champions, so I made the executive decision to give them the extra 10 points. Let's continue. 18 points, we have three fighters, and two of them have wins over Ray Robinson, Carmen Basilio and Paul Pender. The last is William Joppy. Pender has quite the resume, beating Ralph Tiger Jones in 1959, the old Ray Robinson twice in 1960, a win over Basilio in 1961, and a three-fight rivalry with Terry Downs, winning two of the three bouts. 19 points, we have Mike O'Dowd and Joey Giardello. Giardello is a legend in his own right. He was another man who beat an older Ray Robinson, but has also beaten icons such as Ruben Hurricane Carter comfortably and Dick Tiger. 20 points, we have the defensive wizard James Tony, one of the most naturally talented fighters ever and one of my personal favorite fighters to watch. Next on 21 points, it's George Chip, Johnny Wilson, Mickey Walker, Freddie Steele, and Jake LaMotta. But I really need to highlight LaMotta and Mickey Walker. Both of them are among the greatest middleweights ever. I actually personally rate Mickey Walker as my number two greatest middleweight ever. LaMotta is one of the most underrated fighters in history. The reason why he's heavily described as only a brawler, but his footwork and pure boxing ability was a sight to behold. I really would recommend if you think he is just a brawler to go out and watch some of his fights, not just his highlights. 22 points, we have Canelo and Arthur Abraham. Canelo being here really is interesting because he's still in the prime of his career and has already amassed 22 points at middleweight. It's really a genuinely great total for someone who's still in his prime. 23 points, we have two Marvin Hagler victims in Vito Antifermo and Alaminta, rest in peace, as well as middleweight great Tommy Ryan. Tommy Ryan is brilliant, especially when you look at his resume and record. A draw against the great Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, a draw in a no contest against Jack Root, and multiple wins against the great mysterious Billy Smith. Ryan would end his career with a record of 84 wins, 2 losses, and 11 draws, but one of those losses was a disqualification. 70 of his wins were by knockout. What a legend. Hugo Coro, Sergio Martinez, and my personal greatest middleweight ever, and my number 4 greatest fighter of all time, Harry Greb, reached 25 points. I'll definitely do a full video on Greb in the future, but all I'm going to say about his greatness is in 1919 alone, Greb had 40 45 fights, winning all 45. If you want to see a full video on Greb, leave it in the comments below and subscribe so you don't miss out. So before I go on an absolute tangent about my number four greatest of all time, let's move on to 26 points in which Golovkin and Bobo Olsen reside at. Golovkin actually held the WBA regular title for a long period of time, so received no points until his WBA title was upgraded to the super title in 2014. 28 points, it's Gene Fulmer. Gene Fulmer would beat Carmen Basilio twice and have a four fight rivalry with my greatest of all time, Ray Robinson. Fulmer would win the first bout, but then in the second second fight, Ray Robinson would turn the clock back, knocking him out with the perfect punch, literally. Third fight would be a draw in the year 1960, where Robinson was past his prime, and the last fight was three months later, where Fulmer would earn a unanimous decision win. 31 points, we have Carlos Monzon rivaled the Colombian Rodrigo Valdez. Valdez would hold the WBC title before losing out to Monzon in their first bout. Their rematch, once again, Monzon would win a unanimous decision. However, after Monzon's titles were vacated, Valdez would win all the bouts, becoming the undisputed champion in 1977. Two men sit themselves on 34 points. 
Let's start off with the last undisputed middleweight champion, Jermaine Taylor. He would earn those points by beating Bernard Hopkins in 2005 before losing his titles in 2007, but he receives two extra points for winning the IBF world middleweight title in 2014 against Sam Solomon before retiring. Tony the Man of Steel Zale also earns 34 points for his seven-year reign as middleweight champion. He would also win the ring fight of the year in 1946, but he would lose that title to Rocky Graziano in their second fight of their legendary trilogy. However, he would regain the title from Graziano in their third bout, only to lose the title to Marcel Sedan in his next fight. 38 points, we have another tragedy story, Stanley Ketchell. Heavily cited as one of the greatest fighters ever, he would dominate the middleweight division, even moving up to heavyweight to challenge against Jack Johnson, who he would get knocked out by. Ketchell would also have a six-round fight against boxing's greatest underrated fighter in history, Sam Langford, in which he would lose a newspaper decision. Ketchell would win his last fight by knockout, only to be murdered at the age of 24. A record of 49 wins, 5 losses and 3 draws, as well as 46 knockouts, sees a man with so much potential and greatness die so young. Next is Emil Griffith, who earns himself 39 points. Points, he fought everyone available at welterweight and middleweight during the 1960s and 70s, including Ralph Dupas, Ruben Hurricane Carter, Joey Archer, Nino Benvenuti, Jose Napolis, Dick Tiger, Carlos Monzon, Vito Antifermo, Alan Minter, and Benny Kid Pere. Pere, in particular, Griffith would have a rivalry with having multiple fights against each other, but in the last fight, Griffith would put a savage beating on Pere, killing him in the ring. Now, 48 points in which we have Dick Tiger, and who most people would call the greatest middleweight of the modern era, Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Now, Dick Tiger, firstly, with his points at light heavyweight, and now at middle weight is going to be getting close to the top three fighters on this list, which is incredible. Now for Hagler. I think we were all expecting Hagler to be a bit higher, but one of the list's main weaknesses is that it favors fighters who win titles on multiple occasions. Hagler was so dominant that he didn't need to regain the title and that hurt him in the points total. I love Hagler and I actually have a video documenting his whole career that you should check out after this video. The Italian maestro Nino Benvenuti is on 51 points. Two-time undisputed and two-time lineal middleweight champion. He was simply sublime in his prime and should note was also a great fighter at light middleweight, so he will definitely be seeing more of Benvenuti. In third place, we have another fighter many people argue is the greatest middleweight ever, the Argentine knockout king Carlos Monzon. Two-time undisputed middleweight champion due to the fact he refused to face a mandatory and was stripped of his WBC belt, meaning he lost his undisputed status, but he would later regain both the WBC title and his undisputed title when beating Rodrigo Valdez. I could go on and on and on about Carlos Monzon, but I'm going to save that for a future video. Let's go to second place. In second place, with 63 points, we have the executioner Bernard Hopkins. His achievements truly fly under the radar. Undisputed and lineal middleweight champion, the most middleweight title defenses ever at 19, and would eventually lose his middleweight title at age 40, only to later win the light heavyweight title at age 49. Now this points tally, along with his light heavyweight tally, genuinely put him in contention for top three along with Dick Tiger. Unbelievable by the evergreen Bernard Hopkins. Now for the greatest middleweight ever, I think everyone can guess the man about to be named. At an insane 92 points, the greatest fighter, in my opinion, to ever live, Sugar Ray Robinson. Five-time world middleweight champion champion, a record, an approximate amateur record of 85 and 0 with 69 knockouts, with 40 coming in the first round. In his first 132 bouts, he would only lose once to Jake LaMotta, a loss he would avenge on multiple occasions. Also a welterweight world champion when he was in his prime, so he would definitely get more points when I do the welterweights. And the craziest thing about Robinson, most if not all the clips we have available to us of Robinson's career is past his prime. I can go on and on and on about Robinson, but I intend to make a full-fledged video of him in the future. Now time for some quick visual representation of the list. On the bar graph, you can see Robinson ahead by an absolute landslide. You can also see Benvenuti, Hopkins, Hagler, Monzon, and Dick Tiger all relatively close, but still ways ahead of the competition. For nationality, US dominates once again, but Italy, Britain, and Argentina are all competing for that second place. In terms of pure percentages, US is at a dominant 60.3% of all the available points, Argentina in second with 87 and Italy in third with 6%. So now time for the top 25 accumulated points tally. Ali still sits at the top, but Ray Robinson is just behind and still has a welterweight video to gain more points. I believe he will overtake Ali when I do release that welterweight list. Holyfield keeps his third place by 10 points ahead of new fourth place fighter Bernard Hopkins. Dick Tiger moves into fifth with 75 points. Monzon moves into the top 10 with 62 points ahead of Bob Foster, Larry Holmes, and Michael Spinks. Roy Jones doesn't earn any extra points due to him not hitting that six point threshold for this video. Benvenuti and Hagler move into 16th and 17th, but remember Benvenuti still has a light middle weights to go, which will earn him a lot of points. And lastly, Emil Griffith and Stanley Ketchell move into to 23rd and 24th with now Kalzagi next on the chopping block. So if you've got to this part of the video, please consider subscribing and staying tuned for the next in the series. Thank you for sticking this video out with me and see you on the next one. Bye.